when we are live, I will let, okay, we are live. Uh, let me make sure that it appears in my channel and in the Apocrypha Apocalypse, and I'll let you all know once that does happen. Should be about five to 10 seconds. There we go. We are live everywhere. Okay, everybody, good evening, afternoon, good morning. Depending on where you are in the world, I know the brother David, it's a morning for him. It's late in the evening. We are incredibly edified by his presence, joined by the Master Gary, uh, the brother David, and Father Coppice. Everybody, how was everybody doing this evening? Doing well, thank you. Yep. David, I'll brother, how have you been? Yeah. How are you doing, David? I've been busy working all day almost, but otherwise, perfect. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Gary, you have been incredibly busy as well. Brother, it's good to see you. You are looking fantastic. Gary, how's your day going, brother? Well, it's going well. In fact, we just finished a little while ago an interview with you. Yes. Uh, that's in the afternoon. That is correct. Yes, that one. Uh, great. When, when, uh, let's tell the audience, when, uh, when do you think that that will air? Oh, it's uh, it's already aired. Uh, it's, oh, uh, my bad. Okay. Yeah, it's for today. Gary, Gary, I spoke with Gary it. earlier, and I'm going to be speaking with Gary again next week, so we'll announce that later on before the show is over. Uh, next week, indeed, are going to be on what we love to be on with Father Coppice and myself and Virgin Most Powerful Radio. We're going to be talking about uh, what we're going to be talking about today, the canon book that we just put out, um, and uh, indeed... I am thrilled to be here with you all. We're going to be talking about the canon, scripture, East and West. And uh, a lot of people really don't know a whole lot when we talk about the canon in terms of the Eastern churches as well. Maybe let me kind of get uh, the ball off the ground here. Father, what exactly is the message, the heart of the message of the book that we just got out just a few days ago. Uh, how can you pretty much break it down for the everyday audience that uh, that maybe are barely hearing about it right now? Thanks, uh, William. And then uh, good to see both uh, of your invitees as well, Gary and uh, David. Uh, been a little while since we've been together. Yep. yep. That said, um, basically the book is a question that everyone has on their minds all the time when it comes to theology uh, in Protestant and Orthodox circles, not so much Catholic. Um, and that is, how in the heck do we get this book? And who decided what's in it? And, um, you know, I think uh, it's actually you, William, and you, Gary, that got me interested in this. <laughs> and it's actually Gary's book, uh, Why Catholic Bibles Are Bigger, that was the key to me writing the additions to, to the translation of uh, Reverend Dr. Martin Gigi, um, who is a 20th century scholar, as William would call him, a mega scholar. And uh, he uh, was responsible for probably one of the greatest single productions of what we would call uh, Byzantinist or Byzantine expert um, histories of theology. So he uh, was the first and only guy I'm aware of <laughs> to put together a linear history of the canon from basically the 600s all the way to about 1500, actually uh, until the early 1900s in the Orthodox churches. And what this book is, is it's working backwards from Jujie's seminal work. And it also gets us all the way back to the apostles. So now we've got um, 30s AD, actually even some Jewish stuff, uh, 30s AD all the way to uh, the year 1500 in the Greek-speaking, Latin-speaking, and Slavic churches. So everybody now knows where the Bible came from. So that's what the book's about. Yeah, uh, to, to kind of add to that, um, an area where I've, in, indeed from the very beginning, and when I talk about very beginning, I mean since I became Catholic, even before I became Catholic, that I've been fascinated about has been the canon. And I truly do believe that uh, if anybody really does dig in deep into the issue of the canon uh, and you do your research and you do your best to not hold any kind of prejudices, uh, you're going to become Catholic. It really is an area where where I truly do, do believe is going to leave you lead you to the doorsteps uh, of the Catholic Church. And I think that uh, people are going to really enjoy 
this book, uh, and I've had people reach out to me already and tell me, uh, as, as we know already, Gary's work in this field is phenomenal. Not good, but phenomenal. And people have reached out and they've said, uh, we appreciate the fact that now we are able to talk about uh, issues in the East and really Gigi's uh, scholarship, as, as Father pointed out, I would call him a mega scholar. <laughs> his uh, scholarship in this particular field is, is really when dealing with Eastern Christianity, in my opinion, maybe Father would disagree, I think it's really unparalleled. Uh, and, and I think he does a magnificent job. Now, of course, what you find, what you're going to find in the book are a lot of additions as well. And uh, as uh, we're very happy to say, we had sent a copy to uh, a Protestant scholar, Lee McDonald, who endorsed the book, uh, gave us a, a, a ringing endorsement, told me that he, he really enjoyed it, and uh, said that he learned some stuff as well. So I think that if Dr. Lee McDonald learn stuff that we think that uh, any other Protestant, Catholic, and maybe even Orthodox would, would be able to benefit from this book. Perhaps uh, any any thoughts, uh, uh, Gary, brother? Yeah. Um, yeah, I agree. Um, your book, uh, for me, actually filled in a lot of uh, missing puzzle pieces, especially when it comes to the canon in the East. And I know a lot of Eastern Orthodox who... Quite frankly, they, they're not even sure how they got their canon. And uh, <clears throat> I thought uh, especially um, the transmission of uh, church law, you know, the code of canon law, um, and how that transmission eventually gets into Russian orthodoxy, I thought was very intriguing, too. Um yeah, there's lots of great points, as always. I mean, you and Father, I don't know. You, you guys are, I, I always picture, like, a couple of frontiersmen going out into the Yukon, and they come back with these sacks of gold. I don't know where you find all this information, but it, it's always fun because uh, you don't know, like, what's out there until you guys dig it up. Yeah, and it's oftentimes us playing off of each other um, yeah. where – William is constantly going into the patristic text and telling me what he's finding or what he's been confronted with over his uh, two decades or more of apologetics. And that'll oftentimes cause me to kind of puzzle about um, some of the things that we have to do. So, and I really appreciate also David, uh, his late contribution, which is mentioned um, before the printing of, of my text. It's re just referenced in the body of the text. And then uh, it's it's explicitly referenced in more detail with, by William, which is he added the one piece of the entire puzzle that I actually did not put in there, Gary, and that is Amphilochius of Iconium. Um, yep. He kind of did exactly what I had done with every other canon list in history uh, of the patristic period, and also with every canon uh, canon uh, canon list that you would find in the in the uh, various collections of of what, what might be called codes of canon law. Um, David basically took Amphilochius, which is the one I really didn't bother to touch, um, which was really, if I were doing like a monograph and having it peer reviewed, that would be kind of a, a hole. So David actually uh, supplied that last piece and he was able to show that everything that I had said about Nazianzen, Gregory Nazianzen, everything I'd said about John Damascene, everything I'd said about the list from the 85 canons of the apostles with the canon list that were all allegedly competing with each other, which we see is not the case at all. Right. In, in fact, is every bit is true for Amphilochius that on one hand, his local region, this is what the key is for everybody that's listening. What you're going to find out is in patristic li lists, if you live in um, Podunk, uh, Anatolia, and uh, you want to know what the Bible is made out of in the fourth or fifth century, where do you go? Nobody's ever had a council on it. Um, Nobody's ever had an authoritative father that wrote some uh, doctrine uh, on the which books are the canon, which were then, you know, affirmed by a local council or an ecumenical council. All you got is what you know that your bishops in the past might have met and said about it in some informal or local way. And so it's these local lists that were collections that probably date at their best to the 200s and maybe early 300s 
that everybody on their local level is using, which makes sense if you if you if you study liturgy. These are laws of these these coincide very perfectly with liturgical laws that have been around for since the nineteen hundreds. And basically, what we're dealing with is um, all these local lists are just reflecting like a snapshot. It's like an old black and white photo. They're old black and white photos from the 1800s. They're old black and white photos of what canon looked like at that place, at that local church's time that might only span a few dioceses at most in the year 250 or in the year 275 or in the year 300. And they're being quoted and quoted and quoted because those are the only lists that are there. They don't have anything else. Nobody's ever put together a new one, but what are the fathers, like Amphilochius, David's work, what are the fathers actually handing down what they also consider scripture? And that's where you have to read every single one of their works, compile their quotations where they explicitly cite something as scripture, or they allude to it with the word scripture, which Gary has done a wonderful job of in the past with the Deuterocanon. And basically when you combine what the fathers, meaning a, a canonized father who is celebrated as a saint in liturgical books, when you see one of these guys that's writing, what is he actually quoting as scripture, despite the fact that he's using this black and white photograph list of the scriptures that were used in his region maybe 100 years before? That's what scripture is. And what we inevitably find uh, is that you can more or less piece together the canon of Carthage from any one of these fathers that has written enough writings where we should have uh, enough tens and hundreds of thousands of words to expect them to have reasonably quoted from most or all of scripture. Yeah, I want to, 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 to add to that point there, a real, <clears throat> not a light thank you, but a major thank you uh, to the brother David, because I don't think people truly realize how, in my opinion, monumental his finds at Amphilochius really, really are. Uh, because I know for a long time, uh, people have been trying to beat us over the head with Amphilochius, and David knows that very well. Uh, and indeed, I think that we find the very same kind of thing in Amphilochius, uh, that being that he utilizes the Deuterocanon, like St. Athanasius of Alexandria, like all of these other fathers, utilizes it just as he utilizes the proto-canonical texts, utilizes them as sacred scripture. Um, <clears throat> David, let me ask you this. When looking <clears throat> for the material in Amphilochius, I imagine you were without a doubt well aware of the claims that Amphilochius, by and large, uh, claim held to pro a Protestant truncated canon as well. You've been hearing that for years as well. Isn't that right? But you recognize that very little of Amphilochius was available translated in English. Uh, can you maybe talk about that a little bit, David? Sure. First of all, thank you for <laughs> all the praises. <laughs> and, uh, of course, uh, yeah, uh, that's that's very popular a thing that Amphilochius uh, held to some kind of Protestant canon. Even maybe uh, some of them probably, or the more knowledgeable ones, would probably at least acknowledge that Baruch was somehow uh, rolled up with Jeremiah, at least. Right. Uh, um, <clears throat> What was crucial for me is really a look at the primary sources. Uh, as you, William, and Gary, you both know, primary sources are always critical for research. Yep. Because when you go to secondary sources, you might uh, skip some crucial things. And so when I looked at the pr primary source, I, I had to check up a, a critical uh, edition of Amphilochius. And uh, so, yeah, that is how... I, I basically find find that addition uh, where basically Amphilochius says that even uh, the addi additions to Daniel are scripture, right? And then he uses Syriac as well. And uh, and another thing is that uh, what many Protestants like neglect when they talk about Amphilochius is the New Testament canon. So he's, it seems that like Amphilochius explicitly says that uh, the book of Revelation is uh, rejected by the majority, right? Or <laughs> the, ma the majority of Christians. So if you're gonna, uh, you know, play with these rejections that or omissions that he is not mentioning the Deuterocanon or most of the Deuterocanonical books, uh, 
what are you going to do with that? Like the New Testament is just as crucial like the Old Testament. So uh, you, 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 you have to be consistent in some way, right? So yeah, that, and, and regarding the book, <laughs> I, first thing I want to mention that cover is just beautiful. <laughs> I don't know, William, if you have a copy <laughs> nearby you, but... I do not. I will have my copy, God willing, hopefully, probably Monday. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's fascinating. So guys, go check it out. It's beautiful. I, I have to and... give credit on that cover real, real quick. Let me interrupt for one moment. I have to give credit. The cover, the inspiration... Uh, comes from Father Coppins. Uh, even though I may have picked that cover and we had our editor, you know, make it look nice and what have you, uh, I that inspiration came from Father Coppins. He said, "Get, try to get something with Jerome and Augustine," uh, and and he is he pretty much was the inspiration for that cover. But thank you for that, David. Oh wow! Well, I must have been like uh, Caiaphas at the uh, at the at his judgment because uh, I don't know what I was saying. Yep. <laughs> And uh, another thing I want to say that I think this book is going to be really like groundbreaking. Of course, Gary's books are essential. So anybody who wants to learn and they are something linked about there. it, Deuteronomy Canon, go and buy Gary's books. They are really essential. Both why Catholic Bibles are bigger in the case for the Deuteronomy Canon. But I think this book here you just wrote it's magnificent and uh, really, mm, Father. You know, the Byzantine side and the Eastern side, especially after Trullo, we don't know almost nothing about it. So how yeah. it was transmitted, what was the tradition of the East, and uh, as, after the schism, how it changed. Uh, really, like, Juju's work is going to be, uh, like, filling up a lot of gaps, I think, in this case. Yeah, it's... it's Gigi is a tour de force. He is... Uh... He is a, an interesting guy because he was the first one to really just go to all the, the various sources, and especially canon law, and um, to take the Byzantine sources instead of looking at them through a Western academic's eyes, to look at them with his own eyes. Uh, what you were talking about, reading the fathers and the ancient manuscripts. So Zhuzhi is really to be respected because a lot of this stuff wasn't in print. He had to go into the archives. And he had to transcribe by hand a lot of these texts, many of which he put out volumes and volumes and volumes of these texts all by himself. He wow. did a mammoth work, much more. I mean, I have search engines nowadays. I am such a wimp compared to what Zhuzhi did. Uh, I mean, it's we all truly are. amazing to me. Yeah, how these guys did what they did, the memories that they had, the indexes they put together. Now I just put together a computer program and I call myself a scholar. It's these guys. <laughs> They really did backbreaking work. I mean, they were crazy uh, obsessed oh, with yeah. this stuff. You know, I'm just basically playing video games here. Yeah. Oh, and the and the and the and the Flori Legium is just magnificent, William. I mean, <laughs> now, now um, I've got I've got to give it a shout out, even though he's not watching it right now. Uh, that two two particular quotes that were included there. Uh, a very uh, hearty thank you to Dr. Brock who provided. Uh, translations, because uh, two particular quotes, one from Ephraim and the other from St. Jacob, were virtually impossible to find. It's very difficult. People can look up St. Jacob, uh, and they're going to be really, it'll be really difficult to find them utilizing the Deuterocanon canon, because a lot of their stuff is almost impossible to find online in English. And to know whether or not you're reading an authentic work, I wanted to give a, de a, a dear nod of respect to our Syriac Catholic and our Syriac Orthodox brothers and sisters who also hold to a longer canon. So I wanted to make sure that we had uh, probably two of their greatest Syriac Titan fathers there, and we do in the book. We've had got the great St. Ephraim, who's a doctor for us in the Catholic Church, and we have St. Jacob. Uh, so, um, yeah, just very, very blessed that we were able to get those there, and uh, a great thank you to Dr. Brock for that. But... Um, before before we go further, there is one question. I don't want the viewer to leave yet. By the way, we have a great audience combined. I am streaming on the Apocryphal Apocalypse and on Patristic Pillars. We have over 220 tuning in. What a blessing. Hope everybody is being edified. But uh, maybe, F Father, maybe you can touch upon this. John would like to know how the new book compares to Gallagher and Meats, the biblical canon lists 
from early Christianity. Could you maybe comment on that briefly? Yeah, that book was very valuable for us to use. Um, it's got a lot of texts that have been collected. Um, when we wrote the um, description of the text, which will, of, of, of our work, our combined work on Amazon.com that describes the book, um, the major issue that I'm going to claim plagues canon scholarship, and I would be surprised uh, if, if Gary knows of very many exceptions to this, is trying to look for terminology. And the way I, I make the metaphor is, um, I'm, it, it's people that are looking for Model A's and Model T's in 16th century and 11th century mechanics books. Um, they are looking for the, um, the uh, plans to a TV and a radio in medieval source books. Um, what they're doing is they've got a canon now. They are intellectually committed to it being right. So this is about being right, not about understanding what's happening. Uh, because I really could care less if half or most of the church had some crazy or weird or nutty canon in the first centuries. It doesn't matter to me because the church that we belong to has a central authority which has to publish an erroneous canon for the gates of hell to get it, against it. We don't have an issue with if all the Christians in the world thought, you know, that uh, uh, some crazy book like uh, one of these Gnostic Gospels was um, part of the canon, so be it. But we've got a lot of people that are intellectually committed. Uh, if they are on the ex-religious path, meaning they, they've kind of rebelled against Christianity, they really want to try to drive home competing books out there and try to make a, a mountain out of a molehill on what was canon and, and then if you don't have kind of the ex-religious kind of pushing uh, some sort of anti-religion agenda, then you've got on the opposite side, people that are ideological, um, that want to push whatever denomination they're in. And um, to see what the book here is about is it's, I would argue that it's not really concerned with that because of the advances in liturgical studies. So being trained in comparative liturgy, which is a very specialized discipline, what we're interested in doing is making sense of messy, messy data and trying to come up with a theory to fit the facts. And I don't really think that you're going to find that uh, in any book that you name. Um, the Gallagher Mead book is extremely valuable. It's just got tons and tons of sources. And I think that they try their best in there not to make a lot of value judgments. And I think mm, for the most part, they do a pretty good job. But if you ask for an overarching theory, I don't think you're going to find it in that book. And I don't think that's the purpose of that book. I don't think it has an overarching theory. I think it's supplying you mainly with information. But if you want to ask about the larger field uh, in which this book finds itself, it's a field in which people have a lot of personal interest in uh, their current version of what canon means, uh, it means uh, books of such and such a sort, such and such a definition, and um, that their canon or their theory is they need to find in the past. I really didn't need to find a theory in the past. I'm, I mean, I kind of make my money off of busting other people's bubbles. That's like my thing. I really like to take uh, Catholic myths about the Byzantine past and bust those. And I like to take uh, Byzantine myths about the Catholic past and bust those. So uh, I was perfectly happy to find out that some weird, uh, strange story about the canon needed to be told. And if it was just going to be something that would be esoteric, that nobody would want to read, then I would publish it in a scholarly journal. But it just so happened that this is a story that everybody can appreciate. And so I decided uh, I'm going to skip the scholarly five or 10 year wait for it to be published. And I'm just going to publish Yuji in translation and then add on all of my stuff. So that's kind of how we got here. Gary, any any uh, any particular thoughts or any any <clears throat> commentary or any? Uh, I know people are going to want to hear a little bit about uh, <clears throat> Trullo, and maybe we can get to that in a moment. But any anything you may have in your mind, Gary? Yeah, no, I um, I think that's a good uh, summary. You know, I I always liken canonical research to eavesdropping on conversations because mm. there's so few people actually address the issue head on. It's more like we're listening in. On conversations, and what I think a lot of scholars miss is when you're listening in on conversation, you don't have the whole context, 
And, you know, if you, you need to ascertain the context to understand what's being said. And I think a lot of people jump the gun when they, they hear list of books or things like that, that, oh, they're, they're specifying the canon, you know, the actual canon, the full extent of inspired scripture, and just like we do today. And I think uh, yeah, you guys did a great job at kind of putting things in context and not only individual fathers, but trying to piece it all together as, and get the big picture, too. I thought that was fan, fantastic. No. Yeah, what? I would also add. Right, that, David, yeah, ahead, uh, I would certainly agree that Mead and Gallagher's books is very valuable. I, I use it on a regular basis, really, because you have all the lists in like one book, you know. But uh, we need to understand that these fathers who are giving lists are maybe representing like <laughs> one person or uh, one promile or something like that. Really, like just a few fathers from a ton of fathers, you know. So if you really need uh, to have an idea what the Bible looked like in those particular churches, you cannot just look at lists or cannot just look at those fathers who are giving lists, but you need to look at all the fathers. <laughs> that is how you get the picture. Otherwise, you have a very, like, uh, deformated picture about uh, of this inqu inquiry. To, to pick up on what David said before we move on, uh, William, this is not something that is said in the book, but I think it's something very true from what he is saying. So in the book, I supply all the orthodox and unorthodox ecumenical and competing councils, all their citations. Like, for example, the Robert Council of 449, which was a bunch of Catholic bishops who were only afterwards declared naughty. So they were first ca Catholic, then they were naughty Catholics. Uh, and uh, the Syriac church is preserved with positive memory, some of the Syriac churches. This council, what are they, what are they quoting a scripture? Uh, they're quoting the same stuff that Chalcedon is. They're quoting the same stuff as Ephesus is. They're quoting the same stuff that 200 years later another ecumenical council or local council is. But to play to, to David's point, a lot of the fathers that are in these canon lists in, in, in Mead and Gallagher's book, that are being cited as lists, and we're supposed to take these lists allegedly seriously, they are present at these councils that are quoting books and they're quoting these books explicitly as scripture that aren't even in their own lists. Now you've got to have a theory to come up with that, otherwise known as schizophrenia, right? So um, you've got a father, it's like, uh, you know, revelation, uh, not scripture in some form or another according to a list, and then that same father shows up at a council, and he's quoting something, and the council's quoting it as scripture, and he's a voting father, and he threw in his vote with everybody else. <laughs> What's going on there? You've got to have a theory to account for that, and what they're not accounting for is um, when you have old snapshot photographs, you revere the old snapshot photographs because those are grandma and grandpa. Uh, you don't throw them away. Even if grandma and grandpa have their olden ways that we don't do anymore because we have new, these new cool machines that do all the work for us, um, you know, you don't throw these old photographs away. That's, that's the patristic culture. So these lists are just arcane photographs of the past, and the fathers happily now have bigger churches that with more communications where they got richer churches so they could buy more books or whatever it was that they were able to do in that local church so that when these lists are being uh, recopied in the mid 300s or late 300s, um, what they're simply doing is showing reverence for the past and then they're adding on and calling scripture in their own writings and voting on and quoting at ecumenical councils, tons of other books uh, because there is no competing canon list for the whole church or for the local church. There are only the old local lists, and they all reverence those, and they adjust accordingly to where their churches are today, the living church, what it's using. And to not really have a sense of that from reading those canon list books, that's not necessarily the fault of the authors if all they're doing is compiling a bunch of data. But the data will never lead you to any reasonable conclusion if you just use that book. I completely agree that that is a, a great point there. And I think you would agree with that, Gary, that if you merely look at the list 
and you really don't follow any of the context or understand how that particular father is utilizing, for instance, the deuterocanonical text, I think very often it can lead you down a path where you don't get the full picture of what the father, that particular father truly believes is sacred scripture. And I think one particular example, we talked about it earlier when I was talking with Gary on a show that we recorded, uh, Gary and myself were talking about the example of St. Athanasius. And I remember we it cut to a break right before I could get uh, to the heart of the point, but I briefly touched upon it. That being that very often we will hear, and we cover it, this in the book, 39th Festal Letter, very often we will hear that Festal Letter quoted as if it supports the Protestant canon. Now, I, I, I'm baffled as to why people continue to use that. But then people will not examine how the great St. Athanasius utilizes the Deuterocanon canon before that 39th Festal Letter and after it, all throughout his lifetime, even towards the end, in one of his final letters he ever writes, his letter to Marcellinus, um, he utilizes the Deuterocanon in a consistent fashion. How is that utilizes the Deuterocanon as sacred scripture? And I think that when people realize that that is what we are trying to lay out when it comes to the Deuterocanonical texts, that they're being utilized as biblical books, as holy scripture, don't give me any of this idea that, well, you know, the fathers had different tiers of what was sacred scripture. One had a more sacred value than the other. Look, if they're calling them sacred and divine, they mean that they are sacred and divine. Uh, and I think that is the case with Cyril of Jerusalem, Athanasius, and and many other of these figures. Uh, Gary, would, would you agree with that assessment? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, Father, it's funny you said that because I, I, I had a flashback to when I was going through the editing process for the first edition of Why Catholic Bibles Are Bigger, way back when. And I remember remarking, and it was about Athanasius too, that the way non-Catholic authors uh, characterize him is that he's schizophrenic. You know, he's almost like uh -huh. a Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde, because <laughs> when it comes to the list, then he's scholarly and, and that's the objective canon. But he's all loosey goosey, you know, when it comes to his own practice. Right. And uh, they made me not put it in the book. <laughs> they thought it was disrespectful <laughs> since it was, in, you know, it was related to, you know, St. Athanasius. But I think that's a proper characterization. If you don't take the whole and come up with a coherent picture of their use throughout their life, uh, it, you know, you're, you're playing games with the data. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, very much so. And, and then using Athanasius' festal letter, which is often quoted um, even nowadays as if yeah. it is the somehow the authoritative canon for the uh, Orthodox churches, which is very strange because you know, last time I heard, I think Esther is omitted from the Old Testament list, is it not? Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah so correct. Good luck on that one, guys. I mean, if you <laughs> want to hold it, that, that letter is somehow authoritative for the Eastern churches. Good luck. But uh, at any rate... Um, I don't understand how people who spend their lives in Athanasius are passing up the fact that we located something which is not a mystery to anyone. It's well known. But Athanasius is already quoting the canon as if it's already established in writings of the 350s. He uses the word canon with re respect to whether or not a particular book that he's talking about is, in fact, canon. So he's actually talking about something that has already been established. And, of course, the theory that we pray, place forward to account for the facts uh, in our book is that when he refers to canon, he's referring actually to a Jewish term that's being used by uh, Jewish lists to which he clearly is referring uh, with Old Testament books. And if you divide the epistle up into what is called a chiasm, where you have kind of a, um, uh, a beginning and an ending which complement each other and middle stuff, uh, which is meant to be the pith of what you wanna say, the beginning and the ending are talking about the Old Testament, and the pith of the stuff is him sliding in the New Testament, which he wants to be considered within the discussion of what Jews are calling canon, of what Jews are calling canon. And for him, therefore, um, the word canon is actually from some sort of Jewish tradition uh, of Alexandria. And that's the reason why there's no Esther, which is mentioned, because as Gary has already pointed out, as well as many other scholars, 
Um, Esther was a disputed book, as we know from the Mishnah and various other places. And um, he's simply reflecting Jewish values there. And you've got to come up with a theory that accounts for that. We have come up with a theory that accounts for that. And one which is able to, I think, effortlessly show how Athanasius fits in the greater picture of all the churches which are in communion with each other and uh, who are sending each other about this time. For example, the councils of Hippo and Carthage are sending each other letters and asking their opinions on these kinds of things that they're bringing up at their councils. And then they're publishing their acts and sending them to the same churches from whom they were, they, they asked for information. So to act like these are isolated communities in the mid and the late uh, 300s that are talking about the issue of canon is a serious flaw. And uh, to have no theories that can account for all this stuff after so much time, except for maybe uh, Martin Gigi, who is respected at least within French scholarship up until the 1980s, is to me uh, truly mind-blowing that we've gotten to this point where we, we can't actually uh, try to infer from the whole of the evidence instead of getting off on these rabbit hole tangents. David, any particular yeah. thoughts, brother? Yeah, and, and we have to remember that the word canon was used first with, by Athanasius, so it's really like a fresh terminology, right? So when you compare it to the word apocrypha, you can actually trace it back as long as uh, Irenaeus of Leon's. So, uh, for example, when you look at how the fathers use the word apocrypha, it's either books that are not read in the churches or even an extreme part uh, when they say that these are heretical books. And in fact, that is how Athanasius uses the word apocrypha. Whereas Jerome basically innovates, and as you said, Father, that they started to borrow this terminology from the Jews. Basically, that is what Jerome did. Origen already speaks about apocrypha, <clears throat> how it is used in uh, among the Jews. Those are not heretical books. Those are, those are simply books that are not in the canon of the uh, Hebrew Bible, right? So that is why Jerome makes this innovation. He basically, as he uh, borrows the uh, Hebrew verite, he borrows the terminology as well. And that's a great innovation because nobody before Jerome used apocrypha to label uh, the Hebrew canon, basically. And so that is why we have to be careful with Athanasius as well when he, when there is this uh, word canon first established, right? And if you look at Augustine, he also uses the word canon and he says, the, but the Maccabees from the viewpoint of the church is canon, right? So <laughs> it's really, you need to figure out what this word canon means for the church fathers in that particular period. And uh, right, I mean, Athanasius is my favorite guy when it comes to the canon because really there is one particular passage uh, I have never seen a Protestant to give a coherent response to, and it's uh, it's in his letter to the Egyptian bishops, where he says that uh, both the book of both Psalms and Sirach is the word of the Holy Spirit, and there is another instance in the very same letter when he calls only Sirach the word of the Holy Spirit. So when I ask, you know, uh, our interlocutors <laughs> this question. How come he says that Sirach is the word of the Holy Spirit, yet it's not inspired scripture? That's really a puzzling question because you cannot say it's not inspired, but it's still the word of the Holy Spirit. It's simply a clear contradiction, right? But to be honest, there are a few scholars who acknowledge that that Athanasius is using the Deuterocanon as inspired scripture, like Johann Lehmann's uh, or uh, James Ernst, who wrote a whole book on uh, the Bible in uh, Athanasius of Alexandria. So when you focus on these scholars who really like look particularly in one father and in one way how they used it, sometimes you can find exceptionally some scholars who, who see this, that there is basically absolutely no distinction between the first tier and the second tier. And of course, um, as a bit of a spoiler for the book, and this is actually, once again, just inspired for comments that Gary had made some time ago to me, and uh, which I have from his submitted article for me, among other, other things on Josephus, is the, the real distinction to be made in the early church as far as the, uh, the facts leading to a hypothesis that accounts for all the facts. 
uh, that is published in the book is um, this and this alone that uh, there there are scriptures which are used for missionary activity because Christians are supposed to convert everybody and there are scriptures which don't help in missionary activity the scriptures that don't help in missionary activity are called deuterocanon now and the scriptures that do help in missionary activity are called uh, we I guess we call them proto-canonical books that terminology is simply saying within our own group we can use Sirach because we are not dealing with post mishnaic Judaism which after the Mishnah was actually observed by most Jews, which nowadays Dead Sea scholars are now uh, convinced because of the Cairo Geniza finds and Dead Sea Scrolls and everything else, that may have been as late as the six or seven hundreds that the last uh, Jews actually started adopting in synagogues the canon of the rabbis. Um, and of course, we know that there are some even exceptions to that in the ninth century with the Karaites. Um, so really what we're saying is, um, that there are, if, if you use as the key, whoever the New Testament writer is, whoever the father is, which groups is he dialoguing with? If he's dialoguing primarily with Jews, as all Christians are want to do to convert them, um, then we should expect that the first tier should be the books that his local synagogue, not, not the Rabbi Mishnah, a rabbinic Mishnah, because we have to demonstrate first that that's been received in the local church. But probably, if we have to guess, something more like the Mishnah than like the classical Septuagint is being used synagogue by synagogue in the um, Palestinian world. And uh, we have to then say that those are local agreed upon scripture by the local father and the Jews. And then also we have to realize that there are heretical Christians that are Judaizers or there are heretical Christians who reject some books. And if they're speaking to them, then they're only going to use books that they accept. And once we understand that the catechumens that are being addressed, who are Jews or heretics, or the, uh, the group that is being addressed, whether Jews or uh, Christian heretics with the different scriptures, uh, are the first tier of scripture, and then we realize that the catechumens uh, are actually reading from a different tier of scripture eventually or uh, after their baptism, uh, and this would be the Deuterocanon, then we can make sense of just about anything that has been said in 1500 years of history uh, on tiers or distinctions between the scriptures. Yeah, and many, many times when you look at these uh, heretical groups within like Christianity, basically, <laughs> that mostly they adopted more books. So that is the concern also of Athanasius that, uh, uh, yeah. I don't know particularly now how that group uh, was called, but many of the uh, heretical sects and most of the heretical sects accepted actually more books, not less. <laughs> right. Very good point you bring up there, uh, David. Great, great point there. Uh, Alan made a comment. Uh, Alan, uh, yeah, uh, Dr. White commented about our Mariology work not long back. And we know the Turretin fan just got a copy of the book. And uh, we can, uh, if uh, Dr. White would like a copy of the book, we'll get him a copy of it. I was in communication with Dr. White uh, about a week back, and uh, I would be willing to get him a, an autographed copy of that book and be willing to debate him on any topic he'd like to debate, any. And he knows I'd be willing to debate him on any topic in Mariology. We're waiting for him to um, reach out. Uh, but if we continue, another, another really important thing, I got to talk about it briefly earlier with Gary, is that, and we mentioned it right now as well, when it, when it comes to the Eastern Church, things can get a little bit complicated as we go later, later into history, uh, particularly after Trullo. Uh, and, and today, today, as we've talked about before, David has done an incredible collection of slides where he shows that, uh, you know, things are... Um, <clears throat> Not as clear cut as, as maybe we would expect them to be. You've got certain scholars that will flat out deny the canonicity of the Deuterocanon. Some that have no problem calling the Deuterocanonical books scripture. Uh, but it becomes a little bit muddied uh, in terms of modern day scholarship in this particular issue. But one thing, that, and we do list it, we, we briefly cover it. When we look at a, a, a who, who within Eastern Orthodoxy, in Eastern Catholicism, uh, Gregory of Palamas is a 
titan of a figure. Uh, one thing that really did blow me away in your research on this, Father, is that I don't think Gregory of Palamas in the critical edition that you look critical editions that you look at looked at. I don't think he ever utilizes third Maccabees, does he? No, three and four Maccabees or any other alleged canon, whether it be um, some of the pseudo Clementine literature, um, allegedly um, according to the standard narratives used in Orthodoxy, is never utilized by him according to the Greek Orthodox uh, editor, who, by the way. In the Greek speaking world of today, Krestu is the editor, um, is oftentimes said to be the greatest patrologist of the age. In other words, uh, oh. Greek speaking um, Christians who are scholarly or who are students uh, consider him to be their best patrologist. Now, I, I'm not in a position to judge whether that's, that's true in the Orthodox world. That's for them to judge. Um, but when you have somebody like that, who is doing the editing of these volumes, all of which I have, uh, and he, in the biblical and patristic index, is finding none of the alleged scripture being cited as scripture, uh, but only the deuterocanon and the uh, protocanonical books. Uh, I don't know that there's any way that you can read that as uh, a contradiction to the narrative that there's a larger canon in the Orthodox Church, because time and time again, every it's, it's not just Palamas in isolation, because in our book, we trace every major father who is considered to be a important reference of Orthodoxy or a important reference for the canon yes. uh, among scholarship. And we're not finding any exceptions to this rule. I found one, one father in um, 1500 years who cited three Maccabees at the Seventh Ecumenical Council, but he did not call it scripture. So the question is, what is the nature of that citation? Because a lot of things get quoted uh, in writings and in, in speeches and these sorts of things. Which to me is, is, is vitally important because <clears throat> it, it, to me it becomes very clear that then the 85th, and I believe it's 85th canon of Trullo, <clears throat> would not have become a kind of standardized adopted canon uh, because you don't have the utilization of third Maccabees. You don't have fourth Maccabees. Uh, and if I'm correct, I think Palamas even utilizes the book of revelation. Uh, if I'm correct, I think he does. You, you, you do. Yes. Make... He cites it regularly as scripture. Now, of course, this isn't going to be a, um, an issue for, I think, modern day Orthodox, certainly not right. Orthodox since probably the seventh century, according to what scholars want to claim. Uh, uh, the Eastern churches are doing with Revelation. I think that once right. again, our book demonstrates that that is vastly overstated. They just don't sit down and tabulate like David did with Amphilochius of Iconium, what they're actually quoting in scripture. Well, I sat down with standard editions of Gregory Nazianzen uh, and Athanasius and very uh, other things and found tons of explicit citations from Revelation and scripture, even though it's allegedly somehow not scripture uh, uh, for the Eastern churches, generally speaking. Um, so these ridiculous claims that are made are simply based off of ad hoc studies that um, sadly are are just proliferating nowadays. Yeah, no, I completely agree with you. They, they really are uh, poor. And, and I'm time and time again, I'm shocked at uh, at when individuals reference Trula and they really they've either never read it or they don't know uh, how Trula was accepted later on by various fathers and indeed uh it becomes problematic if you try and argue that canon 85 was <clears throat> accepted you clearly don't see that because you don't have polymus you have him number one utilizing revelation and i don't think he ever utilizes uh first clement or pseudo clement and he definitely doesn't utilize it as being scripture uh so very clearly that canon 85 from trula would not have been adopted as a valid canonical list would that be a correct assessment of that father yeah i think what we should say and i think it's the it, it is the 85th i believe apostolic yeah. canon um which is cited at trulo right. um i think that uh what, what what the conclusion here is what juji had written and i just translated and and polished a bit and, and this is it, it's the following everyone after Phocius the great and his collection of the canons of the Eastern churches uh, is 
pretty much going to prioritize uh, the Council of Carthage. That's how it was understood in, in the canons. Um, and not only that, but a big find in the book was that the Sixth Ecumenical Council, I don't know if you, I'm sure you guys all saw that one, you, you Gary and you David. The Sixth Ecumenical Council, Pope St. Agatha wrote to the Patriarch of Constantinople as well as his synod and basically said, hey, we agree on the canon of scripture uh, and father and the uh, approved fathers, which were mentioned explicitly at the Fifth Ecumenical Council, uh, and on a couple other things. Um, could you write me back and confirm that if we just use these as our criteria, that everything's going to go great? And what did they do? They replied and basically said, yeah, we confirm the canon and the fathers that you just said. So we've already got, and, and of course, that ecumenical council does cite from Deuterocanon, by the way. So after that, I mean, you've got the six ecumenical council in Greek, um, and it's affirmed that Pope St. Agatho's canon is the same as the Eastern Church's canon, and that they're citing from that canon at the Sixth Ecumenical Council. Why has nobody ever brought this up? Um, this is this is uh, 10 years before the Council of Trullo. So 10 years later, when the Council of Carthage is included in the approved scriptural canon for Trullo, what are we to gather from that? Well, all the commentators on canon law, as Juji has found, from the seventh century all the way through till uh, the 15th, which of course gets us into Palamas's time, all say the same thing. Carthage is the guiding canon. So no mystery here. Basically, uh, the sad story is the Eastern Orthodox and the Roman Catholic churches have the same Bible, which means I guess we just shouldn't be fighting against with e each other about these things. But because of course, that would mean that we would have to like be friends. Uh, we, ha we, 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 sh we have to then find all kinds of strange oddities, um, which we don't understand in their historical context in order for us to show that we're different. This is the so-called um, uh, construct of otherness. Like, you're so different from me that I hate you. Uh, <laughs> and, and this is basically now the cottage industry and scholarship, which it has some validity to it, which is if I can just show in, uh, enough ways in which you're different, then I can hate your guts. Yeah. Gary, any particular thoughts on that? Yeah. Um, no, that, that's great. And Agatha, again, I think that really illustrates this eavesdropping idea of, you know, it, it, you're looking for data and people, when they think canon, they think list. So they're out there searching for a list. And then you have important comments like Agatha, right? And it just doesn't show up on the radar screen because that's not what you're looking for. You know, mm -hmm. uh, there's another one kind of like that. Um, let's see, Pope. Oh boy, now I can't think of the the Pope. Uh, pope Innocent uh, uh, William, I think maybe. I think, I think you are right. The letter to Gaul, and he says that. That is innocent. Yeah. Yeah, Pope yeah. Innocent the first. Yeah. Yeah, he, where he talks about it being the law of the church. You know, uh, Damasus's list, um, or innocence. Uh, list um you know yeah, that gets glossed that over yeah. but that's an important data right there it shows that in the west at least um this canon was authoritative and it was considered settled well another thing that confirms that too gary i, I maybe you caught it in the book uh what did saint vincent of Laren say all the way in his tiny little island in france oh everybody already agrees that the canon has been settled for all time yeah, yeah that's true i mean this guy's uh you know um, basically a semi-hermit uh, in a small island in France, which is allegedly within the throes of a uh, plagianistic controversy and, and various other things. And um, he seems to get it that the canon's already been settled and he's in the middle of nowhere. Yeah, so it's, uh, you know, it's kind of, um, you get what you look for, right? And if you're looking for a list, you'll find a list, but you'll miss anything like outside of that purview mm -hmm. that's that's why it's so important to get into usage and other things which that's why i was overjoyed when i saw you looked at church councils and their usage that's another area where um, um tanner uh mentions it and a few other people mentioned councils but it's like offhanded remarks and in, in some old catholic books written in latin you know mm. And it's like, boy, that's an important piece of data that this is being used as currency for 
uh, ecumenical councils for local councils. Uh, you know, these books are being used canonically in a very authoritative way. That, mm -hmm. that speaks to the, these books as well. It's, it's also something that it would be lovely to expand on Gigi's work um, beyond what he did, which would be some of these councils that we quote in the book and provide all the citations that we could find uh, explicitly to Deuterocanon. Some of these are only acknowledged by Oriental Orthodox churches, um, which is interesting because, of course, uh, probably David and William and you, Gary, have heard more about this. I haven't spent much time in this, but there are some claimants amongst various Oriental Orthodox that they have a different canon. Um, but if we look at these councils, if, if that different canon means they don't have the Deutero canon, that sounds very suspect because these councils, in fact, are citing the Deutero canon just as the Chalcedonian Christians are. Yeah, no, without a doubt. Now, uh, off the top of my head, Alan, um, Alan would like to know, did Erasmus say anything on the Deutero canon? As far as I recall, and I'd have to go back to my notes, and Gary or David, you can correct me, your father. I thought that Erasmus was very confused when it comes to the Deuterocanon. I remember his comments are very, a bit, a bit of a mess when he tries to make a claim that Augustine uh, held to different authorities of the canon uh, in terms of the Deuterocanon. I don't remember off the top of my head, but uh, I think Erasmus was a bit of a mess in the Deuterocanon. Either Gary or David, do you, do you recall off the top of your head, what he in particular, he did have to say about the Deuter Canon. Yeah, uh, basically I started doing a compilation of quotations from Erasmus uh, oh, wow. a few months ago and I stopped <laughs> because I I was very busy, but I, I managed to collect a lot. And um, basically what uh, I think Gary also writes this in his book that what Erasmus says that not every book can be used uh, in the same way to confirm doctrine, not as if it's uh, it doesn't have the competency or potency, but basically you cannot extract that much to, uh, to establish a doctrine. However, when you look at the usage again on Erasmus, then you find out that he uh, used the Deuteronomy canon explicitly as inspired scripture numerous times. May so, Alan, I'm not going to... I have the document in front of me where I have the uh, quotations, but if you're interested, I can send it over to you via mail. <laughs> what, what, I would, probably, uh, what I would underline, though, David, is um, even though it may not be directly from Jerome, it was originally through Jerome, this is just Jerome's pref preface comments uh, that he makes, which are the very source, too, for confusion in the Slav churches up until 1500 about how to understand Deuterocanon. Because Jerome in the Western Slav tradition was so revered uh, because this is how they were allowed to have their Slav language. It was, it was um, mm, there was a pious lie, we'll call it, that Jerome was responsible for the Slav translation so that the um, the uh, uh, Franks wouldn't come down on them like a hammer uh, since Jerome had provided them with their Slav language translations of the Bible. Uh, and this reverence for Jerome is likely what led to his prefaces to the scriptures being copied in the Slav language, that is the Slavonic, and ultimately led to a debate in the 19th century, like the humanist debate during Erasmus's time, of whether or not they should throw out all the Deuterocanon except for Baruch. So... Um, so that's not exactly the Protestant debate, but it's getting closer to it. Um, uh, but I mean, what we're seeing here is some prefacial or preface comments made by Jerome just to have a larger than life uh, debate that's going on in the humanistic, of which culture Erasmus was preeminent, in the humanistic environment of the 15th and 16th century. This is just reflecting uh, the games that humanists were playing at the time. Right. Uh, probably in the near future, I will do a separate video just on Erasmus. You've got to. And... <laughs> yeah, you've got and, to. And I, and I should add, there were like two very famous debates at this time. One is, is Aristotle better than Plato or Plato than Aristotle, or are they compatible? That was one of the big debates of this period. 
And one of the other debates was to rekindle the Augustine Jerome debate as a fun thing to do as humanists. So these are humanist games that are being played for humanist reasons that later get taken over in the Reformation talk. Yeah. Yeah. Another aspect too that I, that you can find amongst the hu humanists is they were also playing with, around with the idea of degrees of inspiration. Mm. And that if uh, a certain, if a book was like really pregnant with doctrinal content, then in a sense it had a kind of fuller inspiration than a book that didn't. So you, there was a pecking order within the canon of, you know, more inspired books than less inspired books too. And, um, and that also plays in it too. So Rasmuth, uh, there's a couple of quotes I, I dug up that he basically kind of makes that distinction that, you know, Matthew certainly isn't on the same level as Habakkuk or something like that, or, you know, the, because there's a, a kind of fuller inspiration there. And, um, yeah, and, and during the Council of Trent, the Council of Fathers, some of them wanted to introduce a kind of pecking order, and they just basically said, we're not going to we're not going to talk about, you know, whether one book is better than another in, in terms of doctrine or whatever. And uh, so that was shelved early on. Yeah. And he was, even with uh, Thomas de Vio, or better known as Cardinal Cajetan, many uh, people just ignore the fact that he originally accepted the Dujo canon. We know it because he cites it on the Lateran Council. Yeah. His favorite passage was from the Book of Wisdom, and he calls it explicitly as Holy Scripture and as the words of uh, of uh, our Lord. So <laughs> what, what are you going to do with that? So the problem is that uh, Thomas the View is not presenting his uh, the pedigree of the church when he uh, basically changed his mind. He originally was uh, trained in philosophy, not in biblical studies. Only later he started to write his commentaries on the Bible. And that's when he, you know, started to speculate. And that's when he eventually rejected some New Testament books. So that wasn't certainly the pedigree in the church. Now, for people that may be wondering who David is talking about, talking about Cardinal Cajetan, uh, that is his name. That is, his, uh, he's referring to him as pretty much with his full name. Uh, and David, David, that is a fantastic point. And I think that that maybe doesn't get overlooked, but maybe people don't know that, uh, that little piece of information, but that is vital. Thank you for bringing that up. Yeah. And if I may also just comment uh, on what you said, Father, and on Truel, basically, uh, <laughs> there is also one, uh, one famous canonist in the Eastern Orthodox Sea, uh, he's called Nicodemus the Hagiorite. Correct. Yeah. He was a he's a saint, I believe. He lived in the end of towards the end of the 18th century, beginning of the 19th century. Correct. Yeah. He wrote this work called the Pedalion, or mm -hmm. the Rudder, and he extrapolates the canon in this work. Uh, interestingly, he doesn't uh, like uh, appeal to Troll at all, <laughs> neither to the Synod of Jerusalem. But interestingly, what he says, we don't know what the canon is. <laughs> it's oh. really, he, he says, we cannot know what, what books are inspired and what are not. And he tries to speculate with all these lists of the fathers. He also says that Nehemiah is not canonical. Very interesting. <laughs> so, wow. so uh, and he's a canonist. He's a very famous canonist in the Eastern Yeah, this is a, actually, I've never spent time in him. He went beyond my period. Uh, I'm sure Gigi does in the second volume, which maybe I'll get to translating here if the first one's a success, which from what William's telling me, it's already a success. Yeah, we have a lot but of people asking have to about volume, volume two. two. We have a, uh, let, me, let me tell you one thing, Father, that I probably haven't shared with you. Uh, probably I, I stopped tallying it about 55 people so far that are wondering if we're going to do a volume two. So there is the answer there. Uh, I will quote what you just said there. So, uh, but if, if you can maybe touch upon that, does volume two touch upon, well, logically 1500 and beyond, I imagine. Right. It's going to be Gigi tracing all the canon debates in Eastern Orthodoxy, um, that were in print, um, from, 
the year 1500, let's say, or really about 1530s, showing essentially um, that the entire canonical debate of modern modern orthodoxy uh, stems from um, Russian uh, Protestant leaning. Um, yep. We'll, we'll call them secular figures having an influence on the educational system that eventually leading to uh, a preference for Lutheran uh, biblical education. And that that eventually leads to really kind of three Russian positions. One is the weaker Russian position by the, uh, by the end of the 19th century, which would be the first Russian printed Bible, which is the same as the Vulgate and, and its books and content is the real Bible. That's, that's the, that, that position is all but gone. Uh, you'll find it here and there in some authors. Uh, the next position, um, agreeing with the Lutheran canon, except for Baruch and maybe uh, the letter Jeremiah and that kind of stuff, because there's this strong Slav tradition that they find in all of their um, 12th, 13th century texts that have survived, that um, they uh, accept... Uh, Jeremiah as a composite book that has the letter of Jeremiah and Baruch in it. So they want to adopt the Lutheran canon except for Baruch. And then you have the last position, um, which I believe tends to be the predominant one. We'll have to wait till volume two definitively tells us what the actual decrees of the Russian synods of the 19th century said and the catechisms that they published uh, in detail, whether or not the Baruch hypothesis is tolerable. But if I remember Zhuzhi correctly, uh, the Russian synods basically that he has managed to compile um, make it the official teaching of the Russian church that the Lutheran canon, uh, not in those words, but in essence, the Lutheran canon is the canon that they endorse. Uh, and what's interesting is during all this time, they're quoting as an authority their own Slav tradition, um, which really accepted Baruch. But their own Slav tradition, um, which only had access to John Damascene and Gregory Nazianzen for the first, let's say, two or three hundred years. So they had really messy canon lists to make sense of. They didn't have a lot of fathers like you do in Greek or even in Latin. So they had basically two fathers, John Damascene, who has a really messy list, which we explain very well in the book. And um, Gregory Nazianzen, who has a messy list, like David's uh, Amphilochius of Iconium. And they're trying to make sense of what do we do with the fact that the canons that Sion Methodius translated were not the updated Phocius version that has the Council of Carthage. It only has this can the, the, the Apostolic Canon of the Apostles, which has three Maccabees and you know has the Clementine literature and stuff like this. Uh, but then we have Gregory's list, which has this, and then we have John Damascene's list, which is just drives you crazy. So you actually have them picking and choosing in and basically you have some evidence that it doesn't look like revelation as being acknowledged as scripture um and yet even though the uh, 19th century russians are referring to their own tradition what they of course are not going to do is is exclude revelation they're just going to exclude the old testament deuter canon so what you end up finding is and a lot of this isn't their fault from a scholarly point of view. This stuff is figured out by Zhuzhi before Zhuzhi, who, to my knowledge, almost no one had figured it out. Um, so until basically 1907, uh, they are just trying to glean what they can of their own tradition and trying to be faithful in many cases to their tradition, uh, not realizing that they're simply under the influence of Lutheranism historically. And basically, because there's enough coincidence between Lutheranism and one of these Russian positions from reading the text straightforwardly, kind of like the, the Mead and Gallagher book, just reading lists, uh, they finally just opt for this. And this becomes the official doctrine of the Russian church, whereas the Greek church never um, really uh, bent to the will of the Russians, though you would have the individual theologian and the individual catechism which would be influenced by the Russian church. And so basically in the publishing arm and uh, of, of the Greek church, meaning official, officially approved published documents, you have a schizophrenia. On one hand, you'll have one publication or catechism that agrees with the Russians. And another one, you'll have the traditional one, which also adds oftentimes three Maccabees. And of course we know that even some nowadays are saying four Maccabees. And so the 
the real issue nowadays is they have so much published material since the printing press, um, actually since the Council of Jerusalem uh, in 1672 afterwards. So in the 1800s, when this whole problem begins, they have so much stuff that's been published from the 1800s until the er uh, early 20th century is that when you see Oxford publish uh, an Eastern Orthodox position on the canon, uh, they don't know what to do because they have all this authoritative recent literature on a national church level, which is totally irreconcilable f with one another, even though Gigi has already demonstrated that there's a consistent tradition throughout all the Slavic and Greek churches, if you just look for it. So instead of going back to the first millennial tradition, uh, they're all in a post-Reformation tradition. Uh, and that's, I think, the correct position is that the current Orthodox churches are in a post-Reformation confusion, and they would do well just to return to Carthage like they used to do. Yeah, I think we, I think we all agree with that particular point there. Now, <clears throat> which, is, was, which is essentially uh, just the position of the, of the uh, re-ratified uh, Synod of Jerusalem in 1672. So, right. I mean, it, it shouldn't be that controversial, you would think, because the, the Holy Great Council in Crete, what was it, 2014, 2015? Right. Uh, re acknowledge the Council of Jerusalem. So why don't we just, uh, you know, give up the ghost and say there is no problem. F funny that you mentioned that, Father. Uh, earlier, Gary and myself were talking about that. <laughs> Remember that, Gary? We were talking about the very point that you brought up right now. Uh, and I believe it was Jerusalem 1672, if I'm correct. Mm -hmm. uh, I, might, I might be a year or two off there, but that is a great point that you bring up there. Now, uh, this definitely is for Gary. I'd love to... Love to get your thoughts on this, Gary. Lucas would like to know, do you believe the canon list in the in the Gelasium decree comes from the Council of Rome 382? Gary, what are your thoughts on that? I'd love to hear what you have to say about this. And Lucas, thank you very much. Lucas, I know, has, has had been patiently waiting for the book to come out. And Lucas, uh, I'm thrilled that you are now able to get a copy of it. Gary, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, you know, I, I'm sorry, Lucas. I don't. I don't think I'm going to be able to give you a firm answer. Uh, generally, uh, the Galatians' uh, list is seen as an expansion uh, related to uh, was it Hors, Hors Mystus? Hors Mystus. And then him on. I'm not sure if they go to the Council of Rome or is it from Innocent the <clears throat> First? I don't know, Father. Do you do you have any yeah. insight into that? I actually in the book decided to punt on this because I did not want to take something that has not been definitively worked out by historians and base yep. a theory on it if I could avoid deciding the case. So what I did was I actually made Damas's decree, so-called council, yep. uh, totally moot because I was able to work out the entire pre-Trulo history working backwards from uh, 691 to the first century without any need to reference Rome. David, do you have any thoughts on it? Uh, any opinions? I, mean, I know, Father, Father, great point that it has not been uh, definitively solidified within academia, if you will. Uh, David, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think uh, certainly I agree that it, this is not like, there's no like ultimate consensus. There are some scholars who reject the authenticity, like uh, Sir Henry Haworth, for example, uh -huh. and maybe some others. But on the other hand, you have scholars who affirm the authenticity, authenticity so it's really hard to tell <laughs> from yeah. this perspective. But that, it doesn't we really able... make any 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 like difference because right. you right, have right. Carthage right after it, like uh, ten years later. So even yeah. if we re reject it, nothing happens basically. That we were able to um, show the that Carthage uh, had something to do with Rome, especially through later councils, which uh, included Pope St. Boniface receiving the canon, um, as well as the fact that the African councils published their materials and sent them to all the sees with whom they were consulting, which were explicitly Constantinople, Alexandria, and Antioch, um, just goes to show you that um, the, the circumstantial evidence from the, the primary source of the African councils and that Rome was clearly a, directed this stuff and it was Rome who ultimately approved these decrees uh, means that um, they're all speaking the same language. 
Uh, we would we would expect to find some problem in Alexandria, some problem in Antioch, some problem with Constantinople. Uh, everything that we uh, the a great contribution of the book, I think. What I was really excited about, which I don't, I has, uh, I've never really gotten that excited about Augustinian studies, but I did in this case because uh, you know he's overstudied in the sense of not, but because he doesn't merit to be overstudied in the sense that there's just such a disproportionate amount of literature out there that's on Augustine. Like, what can you say that's new? And that I could actually say something that's new, which was to catalog how much and how important he was in Eastern collections of law and even in Eastern statements to show that there's an entire history of reception of Augustine just for the canon and the Council of Carthage that has been overlooked in all the histories of, 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 of the uh, influence of the biblical canon in the East. That is a real contribution, I think, to this, this, uh, mono, uh, this I'll call it monograph. Uh, if I maybe just uh, so ex expand on this question that Lucas posed, uh, if you ask my opinion, I think it's authentic. There might have been some changes. Like uh, we know that a later one also adds uh, or distinguishes the apocryphal, the ap apocryphal from our perspective. So adds uh, lists apocryphal books which are not inspired. So there was certainly some kind of uh, a change, but. Uh, as I mentioned in my video in responding to Ubi Petrus, Jerome mentions a council in during his period in Rome and that there were like very famous people like come, uh, gathering together in Rome. Now you don't have councils like every year, right? So, uh, so it really matches. We cannot like prove that this list was decreed there, but there certainly was a council in Rome during Jerome's period. So I, I tend to believe it's authentic. Which would fit with that period of the day you know, around 382, wouldn't it, David? Yeah, yeah, certainly. Right, right. Um, but great, great uh, theory there. But again, I think you you bring a, you, you hammer home the point that um, <clears throat> either which way we've got uh, what has been dubbed the North African Code, as Father pointed out there, uh, being Hippo and Carthage, 393, 397, uh, which I think are very, very good points. Earlier, I think John, and by the way, John, thank you for tuning in, can't find it, but John wanted to know what we were talking about, what letter it was of Pope Agatho. And I believe off the top of my head, that is the letter at the inauguration of the council. Father, off the top of your head, is that correct? Um, yeah, I believe so. Um, okay. And I don't remember, I think that that portion of the letter might be available on New Advent in English. There were some portions where, which weren't available. I think I had to ah, translate. You did. I remember you did. Yeah. I, in fact, I remember I was there when you did. There was a, uh, some portions that were not translated into English. And I think uh, maybe Gary remembers. We even called Gary. We'll put Gary in a speakerphone uh, when we were talking about that. Do you remember that, Gary? Yeah. Yeah, but I don't remember how that came about, you know. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I remember that very well. Uh, but yeah, yeah, that's a great point. Yes, you did have to translate that. The translation, by the way, for people wondering, is uh, you can find that there uh, in the book. Now, we're coming about the uh, the one hour and 30 minute mark, which is the the sweet spot. So we got about maybe about 10 minutes more. If people have anything on your mind, any questions, please send them right now. We'll wrap up in about 10 or 11 minutes. And I know you want to be sensitive to Father's time, Gary's time, and David, who is in, over there in Europe. We are thrilled that he's here with us in the evening. Uh, the, really, really thrilled that he's here. People that may be wondering what we're talking about. We're talking about our brand new book we came out with on the canon. You can find it on Amazon right now, A Complete History of the Biblical Canon in the Christian East and Latin West, Volume 1. God willing, Volume 2 will come out in the near future as well. So if anybody... If you have anything on your mind right now, we are live on right here on the Apocrypha Apocalypse and over on my channel, Patristic Pillars. Some of you people from over there, Patristic Pillars, come on over here uh, and, uh, you know, anything you may have on your mind, share it here. Now, I know I'm also on Facebook right now. I do not know what's being said in Facebook. It, I don't think it comes out here. So if you do have anything on your mind, please share it right now in the meantime uh david any thoughts or comments or or gary anything on your mind in the meantime mm. 
Yeah. Yeah. Any, uh, any we, uh, insights? Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, David. No, no, no. Go ahead. I, I, I'll comment yeah. after you. I was just going to throw a question to uh, Father and William. Any particular insights on uh, John of Damascus, John Damascene? Because he's been brought up by some noted uh, Protestants as uh, a part of their argument against the Catholic canon. Yeah. Um, actually, Gigi had already noticed that I believe an 18th century author had already solved the problem, which was um, Damascene um, had no access to the Council of Trullo because he was outside the empire. Trullo was with an emperor that was hostile to the Arab states at the time. Um, we also have to deal with the fact that there is the iconoclast emperors who are not buddies with uh, Damascene. So even though the, it was not an iconoclast emperor that convoked the council and wrote it at Trullo in 691, by 713, we had iconoclasts there. And I think what a lot of people don't realize is that this material, once it gets written down, um, it oftentimes takes a very long time to spread. Uh, there's some principal sees that a copy of the Trullo Council would be sent to, uh, obviously Rome and a couple others, but Rome doesn't want to copy the thing. They hated the thing. Um, and the question is, who else would be copying this at this time? Uh, we, we, do, we, we don't necessarily know, uh, but we have some pretty good ideas. And so basically Damascene is stuck with the same problem that Gregory Nazianzen has, the same problem that Amphilochius has. He has no local Jerusalem lists um, showing no evidence of quoting from any of the Byzantine collections of canon law from the uh, sixth century, uh, late sixth century that, that have, for example, Carthage. And so he knows what the books of scripture are because he quotes them in scripture, which Gigi shows that he quotes virtually all the Deuterocanon as scripture and obviously Revelation as scripture. And so the question is, when he wants to talk about scripture in his um, handbook for theology is supposed to talk about all theology, so he's going to have to list the canon. He he doesn't make up lists on your own. This is not what you do in patristic theology and patristic literature. You don't on your own authority, particularly as a monk, not even as a bishop, you don't just make up what you think are the scriptural lists because you see everybody quoting it. You have to have an authority. So what does he do? He takes pretty much the only antique uh, list he has access to, which is something like Epiphan Epiphanius of Salamis's list. And he basically um, takes that list and then he um, either has a uh, redacted version of it that he has inherited for his local church or he uses some version of it that he has. And then he continues to quote everything as scripture just as St. Gregory of Nazianzen did and Amphilochius did from the Deuterocanon. Because once again, you have a snapshot from the revered past you don't mess with it. That's what heretics do. They interpolate lists. They change lists. They change scripture. You don't change the past. You hand it on. And then if you have a council which replaces this old stuff, that's fine. But he doesn't have one. So he just adds onto the list what he sees all the fathers calling scripture. And he lives in that schizophrenic world because that's what he inherited. Great, great point there, um, Father. Great point. And, and by the way, for people wondering... We do include multiple quotes from John Damascene utilizing Deuterocanonical texts. You can find that there in the book. Now, here's one that is just directly for you, Father. Robert Tapia want, would like to know, do the Orthodox have an open canon and why? That, that is, you know, let me, let me kind of lay that out first. I think that when people talk about an open canon, I think that that modern-day utilization of that term means that more books at a later period can be added to the canon. Uh, how would you answer that, Father? I would say that um, what individual scholars and what individual bishops are saying um, is admittedly by them all not orthodoxy. Yeah. They would claim, uh, at the very least, that what represents orthodoxy is the patristic mindset. That would be the, the one position. Uh, which is, sounds very generic, but I'm, uh, I'm going to repeat that. Another position would be uh, pan-Orthodox councils. Another position would be ecumenical councils. Now, I don't think anybody's going to deny ecumenical councils. Um, all of them would probably admit, in theory, that there's something called the 
uh, patristic mindset, which is what the fathers have some kind of unanimity on. Now, that gets kind of fuzzy when you talk about, is that quantitative, numerical, proportional, what is it? But we've already demonstrated in the book that all the great fathers and um, post-East-West schism saints of orthodoxy can be shown to be in the same tradition, which is the Deuterocanon of Carthage. Um, we've already shown that the Council of Jerusalem, which is a pan-Orthodox council, uh, has the same exact canon as Trent. And we've already shown in the book that the commentators on the canons of the Eastern churches up into the 15th century, from the 11th to the 15th centuries, all agree that the Council of Carthage is normative. So if you ask me, what do what does orthodoxy say about it on a pan-orthodox level, on a canonical level, on a patristic level, it says the same thing that Trent does. But if you want to ask me, what does what do blogospheric orthodox, what do scholars who um, have the respect of ruling bishops and what do ruling bishops say is orthodoxy? Um, probably the same thing that we can find Catholic priests, God forbid, but saying about uh, God knows what um, at one time or place or whatnot. And even on the occasion, the a bishop that says some pretty crazy stuff, um, uh, for them, maybe their craziness is a, is a little bit more frequent on this particular topic than our craziness. But, um, you know, um, can I find what is being said about open canon uh, in first millennial orthodoxy? No. Can I find it in the first 15 centuries? I cannot. Can I find it through David with St. Athanasius uh, or, or St. Nicodemus of the Holy Mountain? Apparently, uh, his reading would say that there is a canonical basis with a commentator and a saint from the 19th century, which makes perfect sense because this is exactly when we see the influence of Lutheranism, which I can't prove with um, St. Nicodemus of the Holy Mountain because I haven't done the work on that. But he, he falls right within that period that we expect the Protestant influences. So does the Orthodoxy have an open canon? If it's a vote of the scholars and the blogosphere and maybe even bishops? The answer is yes. But if it's the traditions that I just mentioned, then the answer is clearly no. Great. Father, you laid that out perfectly, I think, in a great way. Now, <clears throat> we'll take one more. Let me give it to Gary, and maybe uh, David can uh, provide a supplementary, re supplementary response. Um, Catholics claim that we receive the canon from Christ and his disciples, yet we also claim the canon was made by the Catholic Church in the African councils and Damasus. Is this not a contradiction? Uh, Gary, uh, how would you reply to that? Yeah, well, <clears throat> that, well, no one makes the canon except God. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. since Jesus is God, he knows what the how many books he inspired. And he certainly would have passed that datum on to the church and that would be part of the rule of faith, okay? But when you're talking about making quote unquote a canon, uh, usually what's being referred to there is that it becomes part of the disciplinary law of the church. So uh, something could be the rule of faith without actually being solemnly defined or solemnly pronounced on, you know, uh, simply because it just wasn't regulated, you know? Um, so, uh, that's kind of where it is. Uh, you know, yes, it, it comes from Jesus. Uh, Jesus made the canon cause he's God. Uh, but in terms of formalizing it as part of a uniformed, uh, rule for the church or a law of the church, you would have to look at the, uh, Carthesian councils and, uh, papal decrees that formalize it and solemnly make it part of the, the the law of the church. So uh, hopefully that helps. David, do you want to add anything? Mm, actually not. I agree. <laughs> 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 Maybe I would add to the open canon question. Uh, I agree with Father that it depends on who are you asking it. Now, if you're going to look at a scholar who wrote an Eastern Orthodox uh, Old Testament canon, you probably find only one or maybe two, <laughs> but the uh, most notable one is Eugene uh, Pentuk. 
and he uh, basically brings up uh, Eugene Ulrich's definition of the canon. So that you must have a pronouncement uh, and a set of uh, or a collection of books which is accepted by all and then it's like stabilized. If you take this definition, then Pentuch says that uh, only the Roman Catholic Church has, an, has a closed canon. So basically, if you take this definition, then he affirms that the Eastern Orthodox churches don't have a uh, closed canon. <laughs> now, of course, then some are going to point to tradition and liturgy and other things, but this is not as clear as well. Uh, for example, he also quotes uh, uh, Demetrios Constantos, who basically did a research on which books are used in the liturgy, and you find uh, various books with various degrees and frequency, how they are used in the liturgy. And for example, you find their four Maccabees uh, to be utilized very, very often in the liturgy, yet it's not basically canonical. It's an uh, anaginos komena, basically, but uh, only for the Greeks, and it's in an appendix. So it's clearly separated, even from the Deuteronomy canon. So yet it's used in the liturgy. So um, what is a canon and in the Eastern Orto from the Eastern Orthodox perspective, that's a very difficult question. <laughs> and, and I basically agree with Father, it depends on who you ask. <laughs> Yeah, no doubt. Uh, with that being said, uh, everybody, thank you, everybody, for tuning in. Uh, we had a great time dialoguing with everybody. We love doing these roundtables, and we will be back. We will be back. If everybody, if you appreciated the show today, do us a huge favor. Hit like, share, subscribe if you haven't yet, and leave a comment down below. That will help with the algorithm. People will get to view the video more. Leave a comment down below. If you are, are on my channel, Patristic Pillars, leave the comment here and go over to the Apocrypha Apocalypse and do it there as well. It will help with the algorithm. We have been incredibly edified by everybody tuning in at one point. Actually, right now, we got almost 250 total tuning in. Everybody, thank you very much for your time. God bless all of you all. And we look forward to being back with you all again very soon. Everybody, God bless you. Have a great evening.